the glory realm, it becomes an objective reality. Isaiah prophesied about this. He said in Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Isaiah is prophesying about John the Baptist and how he is going to prepare the way for Jesus Christ bringing it, filling in the valleys, bringing down the mountains. And then when Jesus comes, he says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's Jesus. And all flesh shall see it together. When the glory came through the ministry of Jesus, everybody had the same objective experience. Everybody saw the leper healed. Everybody had a sip of that wine. The water turned into wine. They all ate the loaves and the fish that were multiplied. They all watched as the roof was torn apart and they let the guy down with the ropes and he was healed instantaneously. When glory comes, Everybody has the same experience. We all see it together. So when glory comes, it touches us at the sensory realm. It's the realities of heaven actually pushing into the sensory realm. When glory comes, you see something, or you hear something, or you smell something, or you taste something, or you touch something. But it goes beyond just a subjective personal feeling and becomes an objective experience that is shared together. It was glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter called it excellent glory. And Lord, I just want to know what that's about. I want to experience excellent glory. Peter's on the Mount of Transfiguration. and He's kind of like, guys, you are not going to believe this. But I swear the face of Jesus just changed. His garments are white. And I am looking at Moses and Elijah. And James goes, me too. And John goes, me too. You guys see Moses and Elijah too? Yes. When glory comes, all flesh sees it together. It was glory on the day of Pentecost. They all heard the rushing mighty wind. They all saw the tongues of fire. It came and rested on all of them, and they all prophesied and spoke in tongues. It was glory on the day of Pentecost. And this is what our hearts are longing for. This is what Lee was talking about in our opening session. This, Lord, this is the cry of our heart. Visit us with that tsunami of the Holy Spirit like you did on the day of Pentecost. Bring in a mighty harvest in this last hour. Visit us personally. We want to see you. We want to know you. We want to touch you. I perceive the glory of God as an accelerant. It accelerates divine activity in the earth. And we are asking, Lord, bring your kingdom, but accelerate your kingdom in our midst in this hour. And so we're crying out for glory. Now, in the meantime, we're going to keep making disciples. We're going to keep on joining stone to stone. We're going to keep on discipling believers and doing the the daily that all of that will continue but we've got this prayer lord send a tsunami of your holy spirit and visit us in this in this day i believe that one visitation of the holy spirit can do more than a lifetime of labor i 
believe that. I see that in Psalm 84. David said in Psalm 84, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. The, the way that I've commonly looked at that verse is like this. One day of presence is better than a thousand outside his presence. So I've usually looked at it. But now I'm looking at it like this. One day of glory is better than a thousand days of presence. Because God can do more in one outpouring of glory than a thousand days in the presence realm. We've got this longing in us. You can't help it. It was birthed in you on the day of Pentecost. We've got a longing for the glory of God. And we're all of us just aching together because we believe that God can do more in one day of glory than all of our labors, even a lifetime. One event with God can be so significant that it's worth decades of praying for. Now, the intensity and the significance of glory encounters in the Bible seem to me to vary according to a couple factors, capacity and calling. First of all, it seems like some of the glory encounters in Scripture varied according to capacity. That is, the capacity of the servant to steward that glory. Because we have differing capacities in our frame, and the Lord wants to pour out his glory, but he doesn't want to wound us, he doesn't want to hurt us, and he doesn't want to give us a responsibility in the glory realm that is beyond our ability to sustain and to steward. For example, an, an illustration that works for me, I don't know what part of the country you come from, anybody from a part of the country that experiences ice storms. You know what an ice storm is? When, a, when, when ice attaches to a tree to such a degree that the branches actually start to snap off and even entire trees will snap and break because of the weight that they weren't built to sustain. And in the glory realm, he doesn't want to hurt us. He doesn't want to wound us. He's not going to give us a, a, a measure of glory that is more than our frame can sustain. So when you're asking for glory, I think it's good to say, Lord, show me your glory, but then trust him. Because he knows what I can bear and steward and sustain. And if he gives me more than I'm capable of stewarding, not only does it wound me, but it sets me up for judgment. Because now I'm a steward of something that I'm not able to properly execute and steward, and I come under judgment for it. So capacity seems to be one of the elements that determines the level of glory. And then also calling. A person's calling can sometimes uh, indicate the, the significance of encounters in the glory realm. When God encounters with you, encounters you with glory, it's to equip you for your calling. He doesn't give us glory encounters simply to pleasure us. He gives us glory encounters to prepare us and equip us for the calling and the stewardship that he has for us. So sometimes it can go down sweet, but then it turns bitter in your stomach. And I'm talking now about suffering, because there is an element to glory. There is, a, and I'm getting nods because I think everyone in the room understands. And if you didn't, well, you did this morning from Pastor Lee. There's a pressing and a crushing.
refreshing that comes with the, with the oil and suffering and glory go together in the scripture Romans 8:17 Luke 24:26 there's this inseparable partnership between suffering and glory so if suffering is a part of your calling then he may give you a glory encounter to prepare you for the intensity of the journey that he's called you to. Moses, you're going to have 40 very hard years in the wilderness leading a bunch of rebels. So let me get you ready for your assignment. I'm going to take you up the mountain and you're going to have an encounter in the glory of God. And we all look at his glory encounter with his face shining and we're all like, oh Lord, give me one of those. But do you want to lead a bunch of rebels for 40 years in a wilderness? If you know what I'm saying. So uh, the glory is preparatory to the calling. And the sequence, it can go both ways. Sometimes the glory comes first and then the suffering comes next. This happened with quite a few in Scripture, Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, Peter, and John, and others. And then there's others in Scripture where first came the suffering, and then came the glory. And in that case, uh, I'm thinking of Job, my, my good friend Job, and, uh, and the, the, of course the cross of Christ. So it can happen, the sequence can can, can go both ways, but the fact is that suffering and glory come together. Is there anyone in the room that wishes you'd been on the Mount of Transfiguration? Like I look at that thing going, man, I wish I'd been there. See Jesus all lit up and see Moses and Elijah, see the cloud, hear the Father declare from heaven, this is my beloved Son, hear him. I really would have loved to have been on the Mount of Transfiguration. And I look at the three guys that were there and I'm going, they were the lucky ones. <laughs> you know, why did they get chosen? But I think the answer is because of the suffering that it was preparing them for. The Mount of Transfiguration was not just to pleasure them, it was to equip and prepare them. And if you followed Peter, James, and John and their life story, they had quite a price to pay. And so sometimes God will give you an encounter with glory so that you'll be able to sustain and endure the cup that he has prepared for you. Suffering and glory go together. Having said that, I will, I will acknowledge the glory realm is pleasurable. It is. When John got in the glory, this is the book of Revelation, John gets himself in such glory that he falls down and worships an angel. And then he does it a second time. And we're all looking at John going, come on, John, don't you know the basics of the faith? Catechism 101, you don't worship angels, you worship God. And John's going, yeah, I wrote the catechism. I know that. But I got in such glory that it actually made me dizzy and I didn't know what to do with it and I just kind of lost my bearings and I worshiped the angel. And there's something about glory that will jazz you. It was on, on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, this is no nonsense, just give me the facts, you know, just business, get the job done, Peter. And Peter is so caught up in the glory of what he's experiencing, that excellent glory is what he calls it. He's so caught up in the excellent glory of the encounter that he's like, can we just stay here? Uh, we'll just make a house for
for you, 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 three houses, and y'all just live here. We don't have to go anywhere. This just we're just gonna stay here, and 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 it's because he's dizzy in the glory. And one of the indications that you're touching glory is nobody wants to go anywhere. When you touch the glory realm, you can't turn the meeting off. You turn off the lights, you power down the sound system, and you tell everybody to go home. But they're like, we've been praying for this for 30 years, and now Jesus is visiting us, and we've got the glory realm here. And if you think we're going to leave just because you're shutting the lights off, I'm sorry, we've been, we've been after this thing for too long. And that's one way you know you're touching the glory realm. You can't stop. You, you just can't. You can't send the people home. They just won't go home. Of course, we know that Jesus had this same problem. They would come and they just camp out with him because, well, they've got glory manifesting right in their presence. And they're like, okay, we don't have a tent and we don't have any food and we've got no bathrooms, but we're not going anywhere. Because the glory of God is manifest and we've been waiting for centuries for this. I see the pleasure of glory in Psalm 149, verse 5. It says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. It's describing a saint in glory, so jazzed by the glory of God that the clock is saying to him, you really got to go to bed, bro. It's 1 a.m. and you got to get up in the morning. But the guy's in bed. I mean, he's just like under the glory of God and he can't fall asleep because of the glory and he's just singing on his bed. This is glory. Charles Finney. I'm, I've got a Finney quote here for you. From This is from Charles Finney's autobiography. And he's talking about an encounter with glory that the Lord gave him. And I'll just read what he wrote. My heart was so full that for more than a week I did not feel at all inclined to sleep or eat. I seemed literally to have meat to eat that the world knew nothing of. I did not feel the need of food or of sleep. My mind was full and overflowing with the love of God. Now, I have done the fasting thing. I understand what it's like to go without food. But I have never done the sleepless thing where for over a week you have no awareness that you are tired. What kind of glory realm is that? Uh, can, can, can I order one of those? And of course, when we look at uh, Charles Finney's life, we realize that there was a price involved, that there was some pretty intense opposition in his ministry that he had to face. And so, yes, the glory and the suffering uh, were joined together. It seems to me that God uses two means to revive his church. He uses glory and he uses trouble. I'm more interested in glory. But in my case, he actually chose to revive me through trouble. I'm speaking of my vocal situation 27 years ago. Uh, it, it, it has been a, a journey with the Lord. I, I truly have been revived in his word and in his spirit through the intensity of the trial. And uh, when this happened to me back in the 90s, anybody, was anybody around in the 90s? If, if I was to talk about Toronto or Pensacola, would anybody have any recognition? And so, yeah, I've got about 10 hands on that. And so, back in the 90s, there were some moves of the Spirit, some genuine revivals that were happening. And I, we, my wife and I, my, my wife is here, Marcy is here in the back. And, uh, and my, my wife and I, we, we went to Toronto, we went to Pensacola, and I would watch the glory go right past me. And it never touched me. And I'm like, uh, he was working in my 
my life through trouble. And here's, here's what I've discovered or what I've, I've observed sometimes when he revives you through the crushing, it's a more authentic and enduring transformation than when he revives you through the bubbles and the laughter and all, you know what I'm saying, the, through, through, uh, through the glory. So, uh, but either way, God revives his church. And he revived Job through suffering. I want an encounter with Jesus like Job had. When Jesus finally came to Job in the book, and by the way, it's my personal opinion that it was Jesus himself that came to Job in chapter 38. When he comes to Job in the whirlwind and reveals himself to him, Job, uh, Job has this encounter with glory fabulously transformational to his life. In Job 9.21, Job said, I'm blameless. But then later in the book, in chapter 40, verse 4, he said, I'm vile. And I just want to know, how do you go, Job, from being blameless to being vile? What happened to change you? And the answer is, he saw God. And when you see God, it's transformational. This is the kind of transformation that my heart longs for. I want to see you like Job saw you. This is why I've made a covenant with my eyes. Job 31 verse 1. Because the scripture said, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So I'm after purity because I want to see God. Somebody goes, well, Bob, you are going to see him. There's a day coming when you're going to get on the other side and you're going to see him with your eyes. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm not talking about that right now. I want to see him in this life. I want to see you like Abraham saw you. I want to see you like Jacob saw you. I want to see you like Isaiah saw you. I want to see you like Ezekiel saw you. I want to see you like Paul saw you. I want to see you like John saw you. I want to see you like Job saw you. Now that's the part of Job's story that I love. By the time he's finished the whole ordeal, he sees God with his eyes. The man who made a covenant with his eyes was the man who one day saw God. That connection is not lost on my soul. So I'm going back to the ancient spirituality. I'm going back to my good friend Job making a covenant with my eyes. I want to see him. If you're blameless, you'll see him. And then once you see him, you'll call yourself vile. Job says to his friends, guys, I think I've gotten something from the Spirit of God. I think God just talked to me, and I'm going to see him with my in my flesh. I'm going to see him with my eyes. And they're like, Job, you're delusional, bro. You're really flipped out here. God's wrath is on you, and you're going down. And he's like, no, I think actually he likes me. I think he's for me. I think his favor is on me, and I think I'm going to see him. And it turns out Job is right. Chapter 30, he comes along, and God pulls back. He rents the heavens and comes down in a whirlwind and visits his friend. And this is what my heart longs for. And the reason I want to see the glory of God is in the words of Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is why I want to see you in your glory. I want to know you and behold you. I figure you've got to start revival with somebody. Wouldn't somebody in revival trigger corporate revival? Wouldn't it maybe start like that? So I'm over here trying to give him as big a bullseye as I can. Start with me, Lord, here I am. Show me your glory. I want to see you revive me first, and then let me put, be a part of a corporate revival. And what I'm really after, I, 
what my heart longs for is the trifecta of glory. Now that's my personal lingo for it. There is a trifecta of glory in the scripture and it goes like this. You see Jesus, you hear his voice, and then he puts his hand on you. And this one just gets my heart aching when I think about it. The first one that experienced the trifecta was Moses in Exodus 33. And uh, you're probably familiar with the passage where Moses says to the Lord, please show me your glory. And the Lord comes back and he says, I have mercy on whomever I have mercy. In other words, I just give this out to whoever I decide to give it out to. And I've decided to say yes to you. So buckle up because you're about to see my glory. He's going to see the back of God. Now, what God does with Moses is brings him to just, to, I don't know where on the meter it was, but it was right on the edge of heart attack. So, took him as close as he could without killing him. And Moses sees the back of God. Then God declares his name to him, the Lord, the Lord God, the Lord God, merciful and compassionate, keeping covenant. Can, what would it be like to be looking at God, on, at his, on his, looking at the back of God, and then have him speak his name straight into your spirit? I'm talking about glory. And then the Lord put his hand on him because the scripture says that he, he says, I've got to protect you in this. So he puts his hand over Moses to protect him. He sees him. He hears him. And then he puts his hand on him. That's the trifecta. Happened with Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, he sees Jesus in glory. Chapter 2, Jesus starts to talk to him. And he says, Son of man, stand on your feet and I'll speak to you. And then he puts his hand on Ezekiel. Seven times in the book, it says, The hand of Lord was upon him. So Ezekiel had this trifecta going. He, he, <laughs> he sees, he hears, and then God puts his hand on him. Happened with Jacob at Penae, where uh, he's wrestling with Jesus. He sees Jesus and uh, hears his voice. They have a conversation in the, in, in the, in the, what, call it a fight or whatever, you know, the, the, the wrestling exchange. Sees him, hears his voice, and then the touch of Jesus. Jesus puts his hand on him and puts his hip out. So there's the trifecta of glory. He limped ever since. Then John, now this is the one that I really love. It's in, in the book of Revelation where John experiences the three. The first one is in verse 10 where he's in the spirit on the Lord's day and he hears a loud voice as a trumpet. So it comes, first of all, he hears something. And then in verse 12, he turns around and he sees Jesus in his glory. And then in verse 17, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead because he, again, took John right to the edge. He says, I fell as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. So it's that trifecta where John, he hears Jesus, and then he sees Jesus, and then Jesus puts his right hand on him to empower him to endure in the encounter. And I'm like, oh Lord, you got, I'm, I'm, I've got some heartburn today. Right arm, but then he's 
never worked out his left arm. So that the left arm is this under, you know, this flimsy undernourished thing, and this right arm is massive. When you see disproportionate features, that's not beautiful, that's grotesque. For something to be beautiful, there has to be proportionate features. And when Jesus comes to John with eyes of fire, well, you kind of expect that somebody who has eyes of fire probably has a countenance that shines like the sun. And if somebody has hair that is white as wool, as white as snow, then he probably has a sore proceeding from his mouth, and his feet are probably made of, of, of shiny brass. So when you're looking at Jesus in Revelation 1, every quality of his personhood is proportionate to the other, which is what makes him so stunningly beautiful to us. And so we're like, Lord, I want to see your face. I want to behold you. When I when I go after the face of Jesus, here's what I personally pray for. Jesus, I want to see your white hair. I want to I, I want to understand your wisdom and the perfection of your leadership. I'm seeking your wisdom. Then I want to seek your your nose because your discernment. I want to discern what you discern. I'm seeking your ears because I want you to hear my prayer. I'm seeking your eyes because I want to see what you see and I want you to look all the way through me. I'm seeking your cheeks because I want your passions to be my passions. And above all, I'm seeking your mouth because I want to hear the words of your mouth. So when I'm seeking the face of Jesus, I'm actually specifically focusing on the various qualities of his face. I want to see him in his glory. Now, in closing, what can we do to see the glory of God? Well, if I could answer that question, I wish I knew what we could do to see the glory of God. I've been pursuing this, as I said, for 27 years, and the journey I've been in on with the Lord. I have a personal belief that glory is somehow going to have a role in the suffering that I've endured. I, I've got that hope. But I don't really know how to touch the glory realm. I can't talk about it from experience. So what I'm about to share with you, just take it with a grain of salt because it's coming from a guy that doesn't have experience. Okay, How do you touch the glory realm? I see four hints. Take them for what it's worth. The first hint I see is in Hosea 8 verse 7. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Now in this scripture, it's a reference to idolatry, that the people were sowing to the emptiness of idolatry. And through idolatry, because they had sown to empty winds, they were going to reap the whirlwind of God's judgment. And I'm like, well, if that's true, can the opposite be true? If I sow to the winds of the Spirit, is it possible that I could reap the whirlwind of the Spirit? I think we see that in the book of Job. When you're looking at Job in his story, I think you're looking at a guy that is sowing to the winds of the Spirit. And in chapter 38, he reaps the whirlwind of the Spirit of God. I've got a personal uh, outline for the book of Job. This is just my outline on it. Chapters 1 and 2 is Satan's tornado. Chapters 3 to 37 is man's tornado. Because if Satan visits you with his tornado, man's tornado is probably close behind. But chapter 38 to 43 to 42, God's tornado is a possible if Satan's tornado has visited you. And if God's tornado has visited and, and man's tornado has visited you, is it possible that you are due for God's tornado? And God comes to Job in chapter 38 in a whirlwind and reveals himself to him. So I, I'm, I want to sow to the winds of the Spirit that I might reap the whirlwind of the Spirit. I believe that the 120 in the upper room, that's what they were doing for those 10 days, sowing to the winds of the Spirit, and they reaped the whirlwind of glory. So that's 
the first hint I find in Scripture to touch the whirlwind of glory, so to the winds of the Spirit. Second uh, hint I find is in the life of Morde Mordecai. Mordecai who went and sat in the king's gate. This is Esther 6 verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Now the king knew that Mordecai the Jew sat in the king's gate. The king knows that. He's, he's talking um, to Haman about it. Why did Haman sit in the king's gate? And I, I've read a bunch of commentaries on this, and nobody really knows for sure. There's a few ideas out there. One theory is that Esther got Mordecai a government job, and so it's his place of employment, and he's working in the king's gate. Uh, and in terms of a daily employment, it maybe had something to do with that. But I've got Esther chapter 2, verse 11 in mind. Mordecai had this thing about getting as close to, he to Esther as he could. He would get as close as he could, and then he'd inquire into her welfare. Could it be that he went into the king's gate to get as close as he could? Jews weren't allowed to enter into the courts of the king. So Mordecai the Jew, he's going in as far as he can, and then he parks himself there. He sat in the king's gate until the king invited him in. And in chapter 8, Mordecai is invited into the courts of the king. So I'm looking at a little bit of a hint there. Maybe if I'll sit in the gate and go as far as I can, maybe one day he'll invite me in to the courts. I see something similar in the example of John the Apostle, who said in Revelation 1, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, when he says I'm in the Spirit, what he means is I'm in a place of prayer, I'm in a place of contemplation, loving the Lord, abiding in Christ. And as he's in that place in the Spirit, Jesus breaks in in glory, and he hears him, and he sees him. And then in chapter 4, verse 2, John goes on, he says, he says, uh, after these things, this is uh, Revelation 4, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must, which, which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. So, John says in verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 10, he said, I was in the Spirit. Chapter 4, verse 2, he said, I was in the Spirit. But they were not the same reality. In chapter 1, verse 10, he's in the Spirit as far as he can go. In chapter 4, verse 2, he's in the Spirit where he can't go, where he has to be invited in. A door is open, and he is invited in to a realm of glory that he can't access himself. So I'm like this. Get in the Spirit so that you can be taken in the Spirit. And the final thought I have, how to touch glory. This is Exodus 33, 18. Ask, please, show me your glory. I don't know what else to do. We want to touch you. We want to see you. We want to know you. Jesus, I want to hear your voice. I want to see your face. I want you to put your hand on me. I want to know you. I invite you to take a minute with me right now. And let's just ache together. Let's yearn together for just a minute, one or two minutes, corporately, with them, with the four things that I just mentioned. Sowing to the winds of the Spirit, if they can put it on the screen, if the four of them are, are prepared for the screen. To sow to 
the winds of the spirit to sit in the king's gate that we might be invited in to get in the spirit so that we can get in the spirit and then to ask please show me your glory I invite you just take a minute before you leave this session please show me your glory just so to the winds of the spirit that we might reap the whirlwind of the spirit Tell them, Lord, I'm going to sit here in the king's gate. I'm going to sit here in the gate till you invite me in. And like John, I'm going to get in the spirit so that I might get in the spirit. Every day in the spirit. And now all I know to do, Lord, is ask, please show me your glory. Show us your glory. Come to us. We want to see you. We want to hear you. Lay your hand on us. Because we want to know you. Amen. God bless you.